Welcome back to Code Report. I'm your host, Connor Hookstra. Let's take a look at the contest that happened last week. Last week, we had three contests. We had a top coder SRM on Thursday morning. We had a hacker rank hiring contest, which is a three-day contest, start on Thursday night. That contest is still ongoing and ends at 10.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, tonight. And of course, we finished off the week with our weekly Leaf Code contest on Saturday night. Taking a look at the leaderboards, we had some top ranked users finishing in top positions. In SRM 728, we had Petra and RNG underscore 58 taking the top two positions. Those two are the 2015 and 2016 TCO uh, champions, respectively. And in our Hacker Rank and Lead Code contests, UE took the top spot in the Hacker Rank contest and came in second in the Lead Code contest, being uh, dethroned by RRRL8523690. And in this week's episode, I'm going to be going over the following three problems. Problem two from Lead Code Contest 69, Global and Local Inversions, and problem two from the Top Coder SRM 728 increasing sequences easy. And for the hacker rank hiring contest problem, I'll also be going over problem number two, but I'm going to release that in a follow-up video, seeing as the contest is ongoing. So let's take a look at our first problem. The code contest 69, problem two, global and local inversions. So the problem states, we have some permutation A of the integer 0, 1 to n minus 1, where n is the length of A. The number of global inversions is the number of indices i less than j, such that the element at i is greater than the element at j. And the number of local versions is the same thing, but it only looks at indices that are right next to each other. So there's two ways to solve this problem. We'll discuss both, but only look at the code for the simpler of the two. So the first way to solve this problem is using brute force. So we can count the number of global inversions by making a simple modification to merge sort. We can count the number of local inversions uh, with a simple for loop, and then we can compare those two. Implementing a merge sort for problem two of a lead code contest, though, is a bit involved, so I highly doubt that lead code wants us to do that. If you are interested in how to implement this algorithm, though, I'll leave a Geeks for Geek uh, link in the description down below. The second way to solve this problem is by using a little bit of insight. So note that all local inversions are by definition a global inversion. So we can restate this problem as return false if a global inversion exists, or return true if only local inversions exist. So if we take a look at a couple of examples, a simple solution will become clear. So here we have an array of six elements. Right now, the global and local inversion counts are both zero because there are no indices i and j, i less than j, such that the element at i is greater than the element at j. So basically, this is in sorted order. There's nothing out of place. However, if we swap indices one and two, we increase both our global and local inversion count by one. If we now swap one and three, we don't increase our local inversion count because we lost the locality of our two and one being a local inversion, but we added the three and one. However, our global inversion still exists for two and one, and we added three and one. So we increment our global inversion count by one. So basically we can't do this because now our global and local inversion count are not equal. So let's go back to two and one. So let's try swapping three and four. So we now, once again, have added both one local inversion and one global inversion, so this is okay. So what you'll notice is that starting with a sorted array, we can swap any two elements that are right next to each other. But once an element has been swapped, it can't be swapped any more further away from its original location. So we can basically check that each element is at most one position away from where it should be in a sorted array. And if this condition is violated, we know that we are going to return false because that means that our global inversion count is going to be greater than our local inversion count. However, if we can get through the array without violating this condition, we can return true. 
So that code looks like the following. One for loop, for each iteration of our for loop, we calculate the absolute value of the difference of the element at i and the index i, and if this is greater than one, we return false. However, we can get through this for loop without violating that condition, we return true. And of course, the complexity of this algorithm is linear in the size of our vector a. Moving on to the next problem from TopCoder SRM 728, problem two, increasing sequences easy. The problem states you are given two vectors L and R, each of length n, and you are asked to find the number of sequences of strictly increasing integers such that for each integer at index i, it falls in the range Li to Ri, and you're asked to return the result modulo roughly a billion. So this is a very confusing problem statement. Let's take a look at an example and see if it makes any more sense. So we're given L equal to 1314 and R equal to 6546. And each of these pairs of integers represents a range. So our first range is one to six, our second range three to five, so on and so forth. And we have a visualization of these ranges to the right of the vectors. And the problem is basically asking how many sequences can we create such that the integers are strictly increasing, the next one is greater than the one before it, and for each integer at index i, it falls in the range li to ri. So a valid sequence would be one, three, four, five. But an invalid sequence would be one, four, 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 because that's not increasing. So the first thing we can note is that there are certain values in some of the ranges that are just invalid, that'll never get used. So for example, one, two, three, four here won't ever get used because it will result in a non-increasing sequence. So we can shave off these invalid values. And once we've done that, we end up with the remaining ranges. And at this point, the problem looks much simpler. And we can tell that there's only going to be four possible solutions because there's two possible values for our first element in our sequence. There's two possible values for the last uh, value or element in our sequence. And there's only one in the in-between elements. And two times two is equal to four. However, this example is too simple to fully inform the algorithm we're going to need to solve this problem. So let's enhance this example and go from there. So we've extended our last range from four to six to four to seven, and we've added a fifth range. And what this does is creates an overlapping range for our last two ranges. And now I'm going to show a visualization of the final algorithm we're going to use to solve this problem. And then we'll look at the code and uh, explain it a little bit more afterwards. And so our final answer will be 12. So this is the code that corresponds to the algorithm that we just saw visually. You can see that we start off by declaring a 2D array, the first dimension being equal to a little bit more than the maximum of the number of ranges that we can have, and the second dimension being equal to a little bit more than the maximum distance of our ranges. The first step of our algorithm is to initialize range 0 uh, for each element in that range to have a value of 1, so we have a starting point. And then for each range, we are going to perform two steps. The first step will take care of the increasing nature of our algorithm, of our sequence, I should say. And the second step will take care of the combinatorial aspect of our overlapping ranges and for when we have a range that has more than one possible value. So our first step, we do it by setting the element at position j in range i equal to the element at position j minus one in range i minus one. And then for the second step, we operate on the same element, the one at position j and in range i, and we do a plus equals to it, adding the element right below it. So the one in the same range, but at j minus one. And if, we're, and if we perform this algorithm on our ranges, we will end up with the total number of sequences. So this algorithm, as it has two nested for loops, 
operating on different ranges is quadratic, and more specifically, it is uh, equal to the complexity is equal to the length of our ranges times the length of the maximum distance of our range. So the last thing to do is take a look at the contests coming up in the next week, and it is a very busy week. We have three contests from Code Forces, round 459 on Monday morning, round 460 on Wednesday morning, and we have an educational contest on Friday morning, which actually overlaps with a hacker rank contest, our rank 26. And of course, we're finishing off the week with our weekly week code contest, contest 70 on Saturday night. That's all for this week. Once again, if you have any ideas or suggestions on how I can improve these videos, please let me know in the comment section down below. Furthermore, if you'd like me to cover a specific problem from any of the contests that happened over the last couple weeks, please leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to cover it in a future video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.